Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. The FCC penalizes the maker of handband drone audiovisual transmitters. The FCC proposes a $25,000 fine for breaking a regulation that is now voluntary. Norway takes analog FM dark and completes its transition to digital audio broadcasting. One of the oldest AM broadcast stations in the United States will go dark at the end of the year. The Dayton Hamvention announces that more room will be available for the 2018 Fest. Amateur Radio continues to provide communications for the California wildfires. And we are two weeks away from the launch of the ARRL's Grid Chase Contest. Plus, radio anniversaries abound in December, and we'll tell you all about them in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites orbiting the planet. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will be here to talk a little more about net neutrality. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLEB, will be here to tell us a little about the J3E operating mode. Our own tower climbing and antenna safety expert, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will be here to tell us about waterproofing your coax connections. And the late Bill Barron, N2F&H, will be here with his annual reading of A Christmas Packet. All this and more are straight ahead in our Christmas edition number 982 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio. Takes to the air right now. Reporting from our snow and ice covered nondescript building here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where it is freezing rain, I'm W2XBS. And reporting from the heart of central New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Reporting from our news bureau in freezing northwest Arkansas, where it's getting colder by the minute, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And reporting from the snow-capped mountains of the New York State Catskill region, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. Wishing you the happiest of holidays from our central Florida news bureau, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox 2 Fox. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Trending in this week's news is word that the FCC has imposed a $180,000 civil penalty on a Sarasota, Florida company that had been marketing non-compliant audiovisual transmitters intended for use on drones in violation of the commission's amateur service and marketing rules. In an order released on December 19th, the FCC explained that Luminaire Holdco LLC, formerly known as FPV Manuals LLC, was advertising and marketing uncertified AV transmitters capable of operating on both amateur and non-amateur frequencies, including bands reserved for federal government use. Some of the transmitters also exceeded the one watt power limit for amateur radio transmitters used on model craft, the FCC said. Moreover, entities that rely on amateur frequencies and operating compliant AV transmitters must have an amateur license and otherwise comply with all laws for such operation, the FCC said in the order. The FCC said that while it generally has not required amateur equipment to be certified if it operates solely on amateur radio frequencies, certification is required if a device can operate outside of the ham bands. Last January, in what it called an extremely urgent complaint to the FCC, the AWRL targeted the interference potential of a series of audio-video transmitters used on unmanned aircraft and marketed as amateur radio equipment. AWRL General Counsel Chris Imlay, W3KD, said those transmitters used frequencies intended for navigational aids, air traffic control radar, air route surveillance radars, and global positioning systems. In addition to paying a civil penalty, Lumineer, which has admitted to marketing the non-compliant AV transmitters, will enter into a consent decree with the FCC to settle the enforcement proceedings and terminate the investigation. 
The case stemmed from complaints received by the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau's Spectrum Enforcement Division. The investigation revealed that some of the AV transmitters marketed by Lumineer were capable of being operated outside of the authorized amateur radio service bands, including on frequencies reserved in whole or in part for federal agencies, but were not certified or otherwise compliant with the rules, the FCC said in its order. These AV transmitters are considered intentional radiators and must comply with the Commission's equipment authorization and marketing rules. The FCC said that Lumineer ceased marketing the non-compliant transmitters after receiving a letter of inquiry from the FCC last April. The consent decree accompanying the FCC order requires Lumineer to admit that it violated equipment authorization and marketing rules and establish a compliance plan to ensure that the company complies with FCC rules in the future. The FCC has proposed fining Acuity Brands Incorporated of Atlanta, Georgia, $25,000 for apparently marketing radio frequency devices that were not labeled in accordance with Commission Part 18 rules at the time. The FCC issued a Notice of Apparent Liability, or NAL, on November 21st. Compliance with the particular rule at issue now is voluntary. Specifically, Acuity marketed three models of consumer-grade electronic fluorescent lighting ballasts, two since 2006 and one since 2009, that did not have the FCC logo affixed to them, the FCC said in the NAL. Application of the FCC logo, which the FCC no longer requires, was to inform purchasers that a device had undergone compliance testing. The FCC also said Acuity continued to market two models of the ballasts at issue for approximately six months after being notified, causing the Commission to up the penalty. We take this action today as part of our duty to ensure that radio frequency devices are marketed in accordance with the Commission's rules, the FCC said. Consistent with this goal, we find it necessary to enforce the rules requiring that devices subject to equipment authorization are properly labeled to inform a consumer that such devices have been tested for compliance under the Commission's technical rules because those devices could easily cause interference if they do not conform to those rules. In January 2016, the Office of Engineering and Technology conducted tests on Acuity's AccuPro model APRC432IP121 fluorescent lighting ballast after receiving complaints of interference said to have been caused by the ballasts. The matter was referred to the FCC Enforcement Bureau to determine whether Acuity marketed the model at issue before receiving equipment authorization. In a letter of inquiry, the Bureau directed Acuity to submit a sworn written response to questions regarding its marketing of potential non-compliant fluorescent lighting ballasts. A footnote in the NAL points out that the use of the FCC logo became voluntary on November 2nd, but Acuity's alleged violations occurred before that. The FCC adopted a rule that allows the FCC logo to be physically placed on a device at the discretion of the responsible party, consistent with Part 18.209, but only if the device complies with the applicable equipment authorization rules. Presence of the logo will not obviate the need to provide required compliance information or maintain pertinent records related to device testing, the FCC said in adopting the change. Acuity submitted test reports showing that the two types of fluorescent lighting ballasts at markets did comply with relevant technical requirements, but the company conceded that three models of its consumer-grade lighting ballasts did not have an FCC logo affixed for nearly 10 years. After receiving the notice, the FCC said Acuity took preliminary steps to bring the labeling of the subject ballasts into compliance. ARRL has in the past, and without response, complained to the FCC regarding the marketing and sale of interference-causing lighting ballasts, as well as about a lack of required compliance notifications. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. Norway has completed a nearly year-long transition to digital radio, becoming the first country in the world to shut down national broadcasts of its analog FM radio network and move to digital audio broadcasting, or DAB. The three state-run outlets, NRK P1-3, 
and commercial stations P4 and Radio Norge have ceased broadcasting in FM and transmit DAB instead. The switch has not been popular with everyone, but complaints involving technical issues and lack of DAB coverage in Norway. In addition, radio users have complained about the need to buy new receivers or digital adapters. Also, fewer than one half of Norway's motorists have DAB capability. Proponents contend the transition will not only offer better sound quality and more channels, but save money. Radio listening in the Scandinavian country has dropped by 10% over the past year, and public broadcaster NRK has lost 21% of its audience, according to media reports. The switch over to DAB Plus involves only national radio channels. Most local stations still broadcast in analog FM. Other countries in Europe are poised to follow Norway's lead. Finland launched digital broadcasting in 1998, but shut it down seven years later. One of the few U.S. broadcast stations east of the Mississippi that sport K-Prefix call letters, KQV in Pittsburgh, will go silent as the new year arrives on January 1st after nearly a century on the air. It's a sad day for broadcasting and for the news business, KQV station manager Bob Dickey Jr. told the Pittsburgh Tribune Review. The family-owned news talk station operates on 1410 kilohertz with 5,000 watts into a five-tower array that provides separate day and night patterns. Unofficial accounts indicate that KQV started out as a special amateur station, 8ZAE, to be used by the Doubleday Hill Electric Company primarily for two-way communications with another station in Washington, D.C. Doubleday Hill also sold radios. In October 1921, the Federal Communications Commission issued the station a limited commercial license, randomly assigning KQV call letters. The practice of issuing K prefix call letters to the Western and W prefix call letters to the Eastern stations predated commercial radio broadcasting. Pittsburgh stations KQV and KDKA both have claimed distinction of being the first to commence regular broadcasting. Dickey cited declining ad revenues and audience and increasing costs to KQV, which has been on the market. KQV is just one of a string of AM broadcast stations to go dark this year. We're just two weeks from the start of the year-long ARRL International Grid Chase, which begins at midnight UTC on January 1st. The objective is to simply get on the air and work as many stations in as many different Maidenhead grid squares as possible. All contacts count in all operating modes, including contest contacts, and all bands are included except 60 meters. You'll find complete details in the December issue of QST. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and I'm talking with Bart Yonke, W9JJ, the ARRL Contest Branch Manager. And Bart, we're two weeks away from the beginning of the ARRL International Grid Chase, correct? We sure are, Steve. The uh, International Grid Chase starts on January 1st and runs through December 31st of 2018. This event is going to be open to all amateurs, all license levels, and it's a worldwide event all contexts count, right? They sure do. Anything and everything. This is really about people getting on the air, operating, making contacts, keeping track of the four-digit Maidenhead grid squares that these people operate from, and uploading your logs to Logbook of the World. And how does it work in terms of the monthly scores? We anticipate having uh, on our webpage an analysis at the end of each month of how all participants did during that 30-day period. Starting fresh the next month, scores are set back to zero and people start all over again. This gives people who didn't have a chance to do something in the preceding month, or say January, to get on during February and participate and establish their activity level for that month. Okay, so in other words, coming up at the end of this first month, at the end of January, everybody resets to zero, correct? Exactly, so they operate throughout the entire month of January, make as many contacts as they can, recognizing the various different grid squares that they've worked worldwide on any amateur band accepting 60 meters and on the modes of CW, phone, or digital. And uh, what about satellite contacts? Satellite contacts count as do moonbounds contacts. Oh, okay, but not terrestrial repeaters, correct? Not terrestrial repeaters, Aeronautical contacts don't count, but if you're uh, working somebody who is maritime mobile and they're using a GPS system to tell what digit, uh, four-digit grid square they're located in, that counts. Now, what if I'm traveling just with my family and I take an HT along with me and I get off the plane, get in the hotel and get on Simplex and make a contact? Does that count? It sure does. Just be sure that you log it. 
Make sure that you update your logbook of the world TQSL station location. When you upload your log logged contacts, you just need to select the right station location. That TQSL record shows the grid square that you operated from. Oh, okay. Well, I'm looking forward to it. January 1st, midnight UTC. Absolutely. Get on. Enjoy. Doesn't matter what size station you have. You're going to have people with small stations and low power all the way to the big stations. They may be operating in a contest, might be casual operating. Everything counts because it's all about what you log in Logbook of the World. Very good, Bart. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Hamvention reports that the Greene County Commissioners and the Greene County Fair Board have approved the construction of a new building at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center, the new Hamvention venue in Xenia, Ohio. Greene County officials have decided to move forward with construction of a new building as it will continue to expand their presence in the region as a world-class exposition center. Hamvention spokesperson Michael Coulter, WHCI, said in a news release. Hamvention certainly benefits from the decision to expand the Expo Center's footprint. Construction is planned to be completed ahead of Hamvention 2018, and the new building will be used for the event. In addition to the new structure, another building on the property, previously known as Fairgrounds Furniture, is being vacated and will be available for use by Hamvention in May 2018. Additional details are forthcoming, Coulter said. Hamvention has been told that the additional floor space will cover an area larger than the tents Hamvention used for some activities in 2017. Although this decision was made to expand opportunities at the Expo Center, Hamvention is grateful for the support from Greene County, Xenia Township, and the City of Xenia, Ohio, Coulter added. ARRL members will see a change in QST Magazine when they receive their January issues this month. Several noticeable changes are being made to the journal's format, design, and size. QST editor and publications manager Steve Ford, WB8IMY, said research and member feedback over the last few years has hinted at significant shifts in media preferences within the amateur radio community, and that these changing preferences drove the changes to QST. Starting with the January 2018 issue, QST will sport a modern eye-catching design and will be easier to read. The journal's page count has been reduced to 144 pages per issue, plus a smaller overall size to match publishing industry standards. Fewer pages will allow the editorial staff to focus greater attention on each issue's content, with an eye to developing more articles that readers want to see. Ford said League members have indicated a preference for articles that will provide practical, immediately usable information that will guide readers to new activities and will tell more about what radio amateurs are doing, with an emphasis on personal stories. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like the Benton County Radio Operators Club repeater system on 145.290 MHz and 443.025 MHz in Northwest Arkansas following the Thursday evening BCRO repeater system 7 p.m. net. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. The following item was recorded a number of years ago by Mr. Random Access Thought, Bill Barron, N2FNH. We thought you would like to enjoy this ham radio Christmas item once again. This time around, remastered by Bill himself at the N2FNH studios. So here now, for your enjoyment, is A Christmas Packet. A Christmas Packet, with apologies to Clement Seymour. Twas the night before Christmas, the moon shone so bright, its light on the snow was a beautiful sight. I sat down in my easy chair with a sigh, through the window I stared at the stars in the sky, suddenly I woke to a racket. I knew right away something came in on the packet. I rose from my chair and went back to my shack, while the radio kept up its clackety-clack. A brap burst out of my TNC. The headline said, 
that it was for me. This must be a joke, was the thought in my head. D.E. the North Pole was the way that it read. I knew that it must be one of the boys, so I tried to connect to the source of the noise. So quickly I typed, con ok on, but just as fast as it came, it was gone. Then from the parlor I heard a soft thump. <laughs> and then heard the front door close with a bump. <coughs> Puzzled, I went to the living room door, and there my eyes were drawn down to the floor. I couldn't believe what I saw by the tree, earplugs for my wife, and a new rig for me. That sneaky old elf, he pulled quite a gag. While I was in the back, he snuck in with his bag. The few minutes I was on, packety-pack, gave him just enough time to empty his sack. Then from my set, I heard one last zap. I turned and was back in my shack in a snap. I thought I knew what this message might be, so as I sat down to look at the CRT, this line I read by the screen's tree light. Merry Christmas to all, and to all, a good night. A Ham's Christmas by the late Walter A. Tompkins, K6 ATX. Twas the night before Christmas, and in the ham shack was the warm glow of tubes in the transmitter rack. The logbook was brought up to date with great care in case the FCC might someday be there. XYL and harmonics were snug in their beds. No Tennessee Indians to addle their heads. I plugged in the mic and my new VFO getting all set for a nice QSO. When from the relays there rose such a clatter, I yanked the big switch to see what was the matter. And then up on the roof, by the two-meter beam, there came QRM like a heterodyne scream. On Gonset, on Babcock, on Viking, and Elmac, on Ranger, on Collins, on Heathkit, and IMAC. Bias to the grid and bolts to the plate, just watch that S-meter while we all modulate. As I turned on the rig and reached for a dial, from the antenna tuner, Santa slid with a smile. An RF choke he held tight in his teeth, coax encircling his head like a wreath. A bundle of ham gear he had flung on his back. Was that my name on a new power pack? He had a stub nose like an egg insulator, and his cheeks glowed bright red like a hot oscillator. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work, laying out all the gear, then turned with a jerk, and laying the wave meter alongside his nose said, Please, QSL, and up the feeders he rose. He climbed up that dipole, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew like a jet-propelled missile. But I heard his last signal from the ionosphere. 73! 88! And a happy new year. Since his start on December 4th, the massive and only partially contained Thomas Fire in Southern California by midweek had consumed nearly 240,000 acres, destroyed more than 700 single-family residences, and threatens thousands more, and caused residents in fire-threatened areas to evacuate. Amateur radio volunteers have been supporting communication for American Red Cross shelter sites in Ventura and Santa Barbara counties, passing traffic between evacuation centers. One of several fires that have broken out across Southern California, the Thomas Fire is far and away the largest. The Ventura County Auxiliary Communication Service Net activated on December 5th as smoke filled the air and the fire grew to catastrophic proportions, said Ray Smith, KI6VED, who volunteered with his wife Jade, KI6VFQ. Their home was included in an evacuation order. The worst night for the crew at Nordhoff came Wednesday, December 6th, when the fire surrounded the town of Ojai on three sides, Smith explained. The incident commander decided to shelter in place instead of trying to move 250 refugees out of the only open exit, which was sometimes closed. Smith told ARRL that several fire vehicles were dispatched to Nordoff High School, a shelter site, 
taking up positions around the campus, and firefighters took guard by classrooms open to accommodate evacuees sleeping in their cars, some with their pets. They were warned that if the trucks sounded their air horns, they were to pick up the pet cages and run for shelter on campus immediately, Smith said. The flames moved east to west along Nordhoff Ridge, with an army of firefighters retreating before them. For a time, the radio operators, like everyone else, did not know what would happen to us. Smith said the fire passed within two miles of the shelter location. Radio amateurs also deployed to the Ventura County Emergency Operations Center. ARRL Ventura County District Emergency Coordinator Rob Hansen, W6RH, said the ACS Ares volunteers staffed four evacuation centers in addition to the EOC. Santa Barbara Section Manager Jim Fortney, K6IYK, told ARRL that an amateur radio digital network, ARDN Mesh Video Network, live streamed video from several sites. Loss of primary power has required using the solar power backup capabilities, but unfortunately, the heavy smoke has made that backup less than fully reliable, he said. In addition, some sites are down because of power outages, and at least one hilltop site was overrun by fire. In addition to power loss to repeater sites, solar panels charging off-grid batteries have been affected by the huge plumes of smoke blocking the sun. The Santa Barbara District Aries Organization works closely with Santa Barbara County OEM and is prepared to support any requests as the Thomas Fire continues to burn into Santa Barbara County, Fortney told ARRL. The Fallbrook Amateur Radio Group and other groups in the North County, San Diego, provided communication at some evacuation centers, and the Red Cross activated its own amateur radio team. As of midweek, FEMA reported evacuation orders remained in effect for more than 93,000 residents, although shelter occupancy was down to about 300. A boil water advisory has been issued for Ventura and Santa Barbara counties. Smith said that as of midweek, Amateur radio volunteers remain on duty in Santa Barbara County as the Thomas Fire has refused to die. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. The time is now 2 a.m. In Bakaba, Belgian Congo, the home of the Jungle Telegraph, we'd like to say hello to Ungat Unga Oomp and Mrs. Oomp and all the boys up at the transmitter. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here. It's Tech Guy time. Yes. Here we are getting towards the end of the year. We could talk about some of the big stories of 2017 and what's ahead for 2018. We could do that, too. You think we'll have self-driving cars by the end of the year? Will you? Here's the question. Will you ride in your first self-driving car by the end of 2018? In some places, when you call a uh, Lyft or an Uber, you get a self-driving car. So that's possible, right? Do you think this will be the year you get your first ride in a car with no driver? <laughs> and how will you feel about that? Mm. It's interesting because people who want to know better, a lot of people want to know better, have been tweeting at me. I've read articles from Fox News and others saying, oh, we we don't want any regulation of the Internet. We we don't want the FCC to get involved. We want no micromanagement of the Internet. Let's see. Let the Internet grow and be free as it used to be without interference from the government. And uh, and it, it I despair sometimes. I think that's how do I explain why that's not right? First of all. Uh, the internet was open and free because of protections, first uh, if, uh, from the people who developed it, and then later from the FCC. It isn't naturally open and free. And I, and I, I guess I, we have to go back a little bit because maybe I have to explain why we need regulations. <laughs> and I think there are people, and I understand, say, oh, you know, there should be zero regulations, no government regulations. There's three parties kind of involved here. Uh, in this, there's businesses. I'm, I'm a business owner. I understand how business works. There's government and there's the people. We the people. We the people. And, you know, in the, uh, I guess, early days of civilization, you probably didn't need a government. You went down to the, the butcher 
and uh, you he bought a pound of hamburger and he'd put a pound of hamburger on the scale and and you'd take it home and you'd know you had a pound you go to the gas station you put a gallon of gas in you know it'd be a full gallon right because he's not going to cheat you because you're going to see him at church you're going to see him around town he's not going to cheat you if he puts his thumb on the scale you're going to catch him and say hey knock it off and if they persist you're going to go to another butcher because you have a choice right problem is if the butcher messes with his scale or the gas station messes with the pump you you might be getting a quarter pound less or a quarter of a gallon less you wouldn't even maybe know it what if they just took 10 percent off that's a 10 percent boon for them 10 percent more profit for them and you probably wouldn't notice 0.9 gallons or 0.9 pounds that's close enough most people are pretty honest you know what most people are pretty honest but there's a few of our friends and neighbors you know them with a little larceny in their heart and a chance to make a little bit more why not Who's who does it hurt? I'll make a little. I'll make a little more. Fortunately, you know, I think uh, in a small town, you know, you, you, there's enough incentive that people stay pretty honest. They know each other. But as businesses get bigger and they deal with customers that aren't, in fact, in town, they're all over the world. There's less and less incentive. Plus, more and more pressure on businesses to make an extra buck. They hire CEOs and reward them not because they're good, upstanding citizens and honest and never put their thumb on the scale. No, quite the contrary. A CEO is rewarded for how much profit they could put in the business. And that's how we want it. We want businesses to try to be successful. You know, Investors want that. The board of directors wants that. The CEO wants it more than anyone. So businesses are going to try maybe to put nine-tenths of a gallon in your tank. So why did we, how do we solve that? Well, we found people we trust to go out Department of Weights and Measures and go check that gas pump every once in a while and make sure it's doing a real gallon every time it says so. Or that scale. You know, you've seen the seal on the scale at the butcher shop. Yeah, it's a, a pound is a pound. Keeps everybody honest. We pick people we trust. If those people become corrupt, we replace them. We get rid of them because we. this is how it needs to work. That's called regulation. Regulate regulation. Keeps our water safe. Make sure that you get the amount of gas you promised. Do, can we agree that we kind of we need that in this day and age in, the, in any world where people are just going to always maybe try to make a little extra buck? We need somebody working on our behalf to protect us. Can we agree on that? Well, when it comes to the Internet, that's the Federal Communications Commission. We, we, we ask them, we depend on them to kind of keep the big Internet service providers and the Internet companies from putting their thumb on the scale. See, if you're Comcast, for instance, maybe you would sell a Internet package that's 20 megabits per second and only give you 10. You might do that. Have you, do you get all the internet your package says you're going to get? Well, I know it says there's little words in there. Say, up to 20 megabits. But do you ever get <laughs> the 10 or 20 megabits? Up to. That's the FTC, right? The Federal Trade Commission. They regulate advertising. Problem is, much like your gas pump or your scale, there's inside there, There's it's a black box. There's workings. You don't know what's going on. And internet service providers have strong incentive for a number of reasons to put their thumb on the scale. AT&T, I'll give you an example. When FaceTime, Apple's FaceTime came out, AT&T saw this, and I understand why. Look at their business as a threat to their phone service. They do phone service. And all of a sudden, people are going to use our internet service to make phone calls. So they blocked FaceTime. FCC said, you can't block FaceTime. Find them. And they stop blocking FaceTime. That's how it should work. That's why government regulation, in some cases, is very useful because it's a balance. It's a balance between we, the people who want to get what we pay for, and companies who, and we set it up this way, and it's completely appropriate, try to make as much money as possible. But we need a referee. We need somebody in a striped shirt to say, hey, yeah, no, that's not okay. You're not playing by the rules. Now, let's talk about the rules of the internet, why the internet needs to be open and free. The internet was created so that it didn't matter what those bits that you're getting from your internet service provider carried. It didn't matter. It shouldn't, it, all bits are created equal. And the internet service provider should not be looking at those bits and say, well, I see from those bits that you're using FaceTime. That competes with my business. I'm not going to let you do that. I'm going to block that bit. Nope, not allowed. There's other ways internet service providers can put their thumb on the scale. They might say, well, I see from those bits that you're watching TV and I'm Comcast. I, I, uh, we would prefer that you use our TV package to watch TV. So I'm going to block those bits. No, nope. FCC steps in and says, you can't do that. No, nope, you can't do that. Maybe Comcast, actually AT&T said this. Well, we don't like the idea that Google's getting a free ride. We want to charge Google a little toll road between Google and our customers so that Google, we get a little more money from Google. Yeah, our customers are paying us, but we can get a little more money, be a little more profitable. I can have a bigger bonus as a CEO if I just take a little money from Google too. 
set up what we call a toll road between an information service and a customer. That's illegal also under net neutrality rules. That's what they prevent, that kind of thumb on the scale. Problem is, uh, big business also has such strong incentive to do this. Sometimes they go to the regulators and say, it would be very, it would be, you would be doing me a favor if you would allow me to put my thumb on the scale. I could make a little more. I could give you a little more. Everybody be happy. Those consumers, those people, they won't know that they'll be happy. Maybe they even buy a lot of ads to convince you you're happy. That's what just happened. Then you get the regulate. Well, this is a problem. The regulators become corrupt, right? So if the guy, the weights and measures guy, is the brother-in-law of the butcher, he might go in that butcher shop and say, yeah, don't worry, Joe. I'm going to make that scale. I just will fix that. You and me. We don't have to tell. Nobody needs to know. What could it hurt? 10% more. Nobody will notice. So you got to watch these regulators. you got to keep an eye on them. And when the regulators come from the Internet service providers, you got to keep an extra eye on them. When they're nominated and put in place by legislators who get big packs of money from the internet service provider, you kind of got to, then the referee maybe isn't working uh, to keep it a fair system. That's why it's important, you know, and we got to keep an eye on the regulators because they're doing a job we need them to do, which is to keep it fair. And it's really important for the future of this country that the internet be allowed to be free and open, that bits are bits, that there not be discrimination against bits, because you don't want Comcast, AT&T, and Verizon choosing winners and losers on the internet. You don't want them stopping companies that might be natural competitors like FaceTime or Skype or Netflix. You want them to be a utility providing bits. And by the way, this doesn't have to do with their business model. If they want to I think they should. I don't know why they don't. If they want to change their business model and charge by the bit, fine. Now, the, the, the other thing that's a little off kilter here is, you know, if your butcher's cheating you and you catch him, well, you go to another butcher. The problem is most people can't go to another internet service provider. We don't have the choice in most places. And that's because the FCC put its thumb, put its thumb on the scale way back when, when the phone company and the cable company got a monopoly. You have only one cable company. You have only one phone company. That's the FCC said, that's okay, guys, because it's so, you know, the cable company, the phone company said, it would, you would be doing us a favor. It's very expensive putting in all those lines. It would, if you want us to develop the phone system in this country or the cable system in this country, you really ought to give us a monopoly. And the FCC did it. They tried to put in rules. You know, your local government decides who the franchisee is, but there's one cable company in almost every place in the city in the country. There's only one phone company. And now that the cable companies and the phone companies are also your internet service provider that we're seeing the problem. There's no competition. So even if you saw, you, you, oh, hey, you know, I'm not getting 20 megabits. What are you going to do? Where are you going to go? Who are you going to complain to? The referees are owned by the cable companies. The monopoly, they have a monopoly. You, you got no choice. So, you know, at this point, we got to hope that the other referee system, there's a thing called the courts. This is why, by the way, the founding fathers created this system of kind of keeping an eye on each other called checks and balances. And there's there's really three branches of government, but I'll, I'll say there's four because you've got the executive branch, you've got the Congress, the legislative branch, you've got the courts, and the fourth estate, the fourth is the press. And the idea is everybody keeps an eye on everybody else, keep them honest. So it's not over yet. The, the executive has failed us. The FCC has tilted the playing field very much in the favor of these big internet service providers. But... There's still hope because there's the courts and there's the press and maybe even Congress. We'll see. And I, you know, I should be honest. Let's be honest. Everybody should explain their conflicts of interest. I have a conflict of interest. I want the internet to be open and free because besides doing this radio show, I'm also a podcaster. I make uh, internet, I make content, TV and radio shows that are distributed not through radio towers or over cable lines, but through the internet. And uh, I'm a little guy. I'm a small guy. I don't, I'm not YouTube. I'm not Netflix, but I want to be able to play in this space with as a small company. I can't afford to pay an internet service provider for access to you. I have to hope that they're going to open, keep their lines open and free to end all comers and, uh, and so that I can compete with Netflix. And frankly, I think we, the people want that because that's how you get innovation. That's how you get the next Netflix and the next Google and the next Facebook. <laughs> What AT&T and Comcast are worried about, it's also might be how you get the next AT&T or the next Comcast. They don't like that one bit. So I have a dog in this hunt. I want an open and free internet because I that's how I do my business. And, and I would hope that uh, you would hope to have the same thing too. 
Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the propagation forecast. We have a single spot on the sun, and like the one we mentioned last week, this spot is extremely weak and no threat whatsoever, at least as far as flares are concerned. With the lack of sunspots, the solar flux index is hovering around 70, and that means the low HF bands remain your best bets for DX, at least for a while. Conditions on HF are fairly quiet in general and stable, but there is a surge of solar wind on the way and it might reach us by this weekend. When it does, expect some unsettled conditions at times on all HF bands. On VHF and UHF, Colorado, the upper Midwest, and Florida are seeing some tropospheric band openings. Look for these primarily on two meters. Foundations of Amateur Radio this morning I spoke with two amateurs on air. Not that surprising since I was hosting a weekly net called F Troop for new and returning amateurs. Both amateurs came on air for the first time in our net. One licensed 60 years ago, the other 6 days ago. It didn't strike me until long after the net had finished that these two amateurs have a completely different experience in this shared community. One started in a world where megacycles were common. The other knows them as megahertz. One purchased their radio in parts. The other purchased it online. One heard Donald Duck sounds and needed to read about a new mode called single sideband. The other is going to be reading about digital modes and how they work. One was dealing with analog television interference. The other is dealing with plasma screens. Both these operators share many things. They are both licensed radio amateurs. Both have the opportunity to participate in contests, attain their DXCC, pull out a soldering iron, participate in social activities and become members of their local radio club. If during their first year as an amateur, both of them read Amateur Radio Magazine, the members periodical published by the Wireless Institute of Australia, they'd both find the rules and results of the Remembrance Day contest, field days, letters to the editor, instructions on how to build antennas, including detailed instructions on building a 2 meter Yagi, information from the QSL manager, DX activity reports, the new Australian call book, and information about the local news broadcast which continues to go to air on Sunday morning at 9.30am local time. In the intervening 60 years, amateur radio has changed a lot, but it's also stayed the same. A radio from 1957 will still be able to communicate with a radio from 2017. Imagine that for a moment. Electronics during those 60 years saw countless dramatic changes. For example, Fairchild Semiconductor, one of the pioneers in the manufacturing of transistors and integrated circuits, was founded in 1957. Imagine that. The introduction and obsolescence of transistors within those 60 years. The first integrated circuit built by Jack Kilby in 1958 was a phase shift oscillator consisting of one transistor and a handful of capacitors and resistors. Today an integrated circuit contains 25 million transistors per square millimeter with some chips being up to 600 square millimeter in size. That's 15 billion transistors. The mind boggles what has happened in those 60 years. But the most satisfying part of all this is that both these amateurs can come on air, join a net and participate in the hobby today. If that's not a representation of an amazing hobby, then I don't know what is. Thank you to Sandy, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Bravo Hotel Whiskey, and Brian, Victor Kilo 6, Delta Alpha Delta. A little while ago, I spent some time discussing how to test if your radio was on frequency. It generated lots of comments and email with various suggestions on other ways to do this test. But it also caused one listener to ask the question, what's this upper sideband and lower sideband thing you're talking about? In the past I've discussed the history of these two, but I've gone back to check and it doesn't appear that I've ever actually explained what exactly upper sideband and lower sideband might be, and how they work, and more to the point, why they're important. Let's start where you find these modes. In amateur radio, some bands use upper sideband and some use lower. From a usage perspective, it's pretty straightforward, but not obvious. 
Essentially, everyone uses upper sideband all the time, except radio amateurs below 10 MHz. There's one exception in that. The 60 meter band, 5 MHz, uses upper sideband. The mechanics aside, what is the point? How does it work? And why does it matter? If you've ever seen an AM broadcast via a waterfall display or on a spectrum analyzer, you'll have seen a symmetrical picture with a big spike in the middle. The spike in the middle is the carrier, and the two sides are duplicate copies of each other. If you were to do some math, you'd discover that the spike accounts for 50% of the energy that's embedded within the AM signal. And you'll realize that doubling the other halves takes care of the other 50% of the energy. If you eliminate both the spike and one half, you end up consuming 25% of the original AM signal in terms of energy. That essentially means that you can now spend all of that available energy in your transmission and in effect get a signal that's four times stronger than the original AM signal. A better way to say that is single sideband is four times as efficient as an AM signal. Now, if you took the right half of the signal, you'd end up with an upper sideband signal. And if you took the left half of the signal, you'd end up with a lower sideband signal. The signals are identical, but they're reversed. From a technical perspective, the upper sideband signal represents your audio from left to right, low or bass frequencies on the left, and high or treble frequencies on the right. A lower sideband signal reverses that which is why a voice sounds unintelligible if you get upper sideband and lower sideband mixed up. The alignment of the radio to a specific frequency works because you can map the audio frequency directly to the tuning frequency. That might not be immediately obvious, but let's imagine an upper sideband signal at 10 MHz. At exactly 10 MHz, the audio frequency of 0 Hz is represented. At 10.001 MHz, the audio of 1 kHz is represented, and at 10.002 MHz, the audio of 2 kHz is represented. If your radio is off frequency by, say, 50 Hz, then the sound you'll hear will be off by 50 Hz across all of those. So 10.001 MHz won't sound like 1 kHz, it will sound like 950 Hz, and 2 kHz will sound like 1950 Hz. On the other side, if you flip to lower sideband, 1 kHz will sound like 1050 Hz, and 2 kHz will sound like 2050 Hz. Upper and lower sideband, nifty solution, better signals, less bandwidth use, and all in all, a great way to play with radio. Remember, everyone uses upper sideband all the time, except for radio amateurs below 10 MHz, but not on 5 MHz. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. Vietnam War veteran John Nugent, WA2EQJ, got on the air for what likely will be his final time earlier this month, thanks to help from the amateur radio community. The 75-year-old U.S. Army Signal Corps veteran, who has cancer, lives at the James A. Lovell Federal Health Care Center in North Chicago. Licensed since he was 16, he told a social worker at the facility that one item on his bucket list was to operate the ham radio one last time. Staffers at the facility got in touch with the Lake County Veterans Assistance Commission, and replies came from the American Legion Amateur Radio Club, the North Shore Amateur Radio Club, and Lake County Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, among others. He was just over the moon, social worker Alicia Benke told the Chicago Tribune. We had no idea we were going to pull it off. The various radio volunteers did, though, setting up an antenna outside the facility and a simple HF station inside. David Hartnett, K9DRH, and crew Don Whitney, K9DRW, James Nelson, K9QF, Harry Hahn, WB9R, and Scott Campbell, KC9SJP, were among those who made it happen. ARRL Illinois Section Manager Ron Morgan, AD9I, spread the word that WA2EQJ would be on the air. John is terminally ill and wanted to make some 20-meter radio contacts one last time, a post on the Lake County Racies page recounted. He had been in the Lovell Center for more than three years. Nugent volunteered to serve in the Army and was wounded during his Vietnam service. On December 5th, Nugent, with the help of his family members and Lovell Center staff, turned on his radio and workstations in California, Illinois, and Texas. After the contacts were in the log, Nugent's son Chris thanked the Lake County Racies and other volunteers who facilitated his dad's last wish.
Among the stations Nugent worked was the special event station W9F, operated by members of the Fermi Lab Amateur Radio Club to mark its 50th anniversary of the National Accelerator Laboratory. We were able to add dying Army vet John Nugent, WA2EQJ, to the W9F special event log because of the rapid email alert from the ARRL Illinois section manager, notifying ARRL members that it was Mr. Nugent's dying wish to make a final radio contact. Micheline Prieskop, KC9ARP, told ARRL, it was a truly touching and unforgettable experience. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Here's a subject most hams have had to deal with on towers, on the roof, or on the ground. Waterproofing coax connections. Let's look at the four most popular products I know of. The most commonly used product I know of is called coax seal. This stuff is sold on small rolls, about a half an inch wide and 60 inches long. It is easy to apply to clean and dry surfaces. At the size sold, one roll does not cover much except maybe one or two small connectors. My experience with coax seal is it stands up to the elements well over a period of years and is somewhat reusable for the first months in the environment. On a commercial tower, the white strips of paper fly away nicely in a gentle breeze. Being sold on a roll, it is easy to secure several to a climbing belt like rolls of electrical tape. In a tool bag, it tends to get squished into shapes that make it hard to use. Another method of protecting connections is with liquid electrical tape. This stuff is commonly sold in small, 4-ounce cans at the hardware store. These small cans are similar to those used for PVC cement and include a brush. This substance is similar to a solvent dissolved polymer, perhaps even rubber. Since it is kept in a liquid state with solvents, which evaporate when it applied or when the can is left open, you probably don't want to smoke while the can is open. After application with this product, the protective layer tends to be much thinner than with the wrap type sealer. This does make an excellent underlayer when using a wrap on sealer. For ground level connections where repeated layers can be added, this stuff is both easy to use and a good value. Liquid electrical tape probably cannot be applied over coax seal, but it can be applied onto less than perfect surfaces. But again, clean and dry is best. According to the label, multiple layers can be added if you allow the stuff to set for about five minutes. Since it is sold in the can, it rides along in the tool bag, but is easily dropped. Although I've only seen one, this one used a couple of times, some people still use electrical tape to seal coax connections. I do not recommend using electrical tape unless it is used as a cover over one of the wraps or brush on sealers. Problem with electrical tape is it ages poorly when exposed to sunlight, moisture, heat and more. It tends to start to unwrap over time, crack or get brittle. When you've installed as many antennas as I have, you've probably read some mention of how thickly you can cover a connection before you mess up that antenna's ability to shed rainwater. So the bottom line on, on electrical tape is I will not recommend using it as a primary protective layer. The fourth method I know of is similar to coax seal on rolls. Some commercial climbers use insulation wrap for automotive air conditioner systems. There are lots of brands available, so you'll have to go to several auto parts stores to hunt for the really good stuff. This wrap is much wider and thicker than coax seal and comes on a roll just like coax seal. This is made to be wrapped on metal tubes coming in and out of automotive air conditioner compressors to reduce dripping of water, improve efficiency, and protect from the elements. And since it is made to stand up to the elements and is also cost effective, the only startup cost for you is doing the research and finding a brand and a supplier. There are lots of different kinds, so look for the one most like coax seal and test it on your own before using it on someone else's antenna. Oh yeah, there is one more similar to coax seal. It is sold in a toothpaste type tube. I've never used any, so I can't comment on how it holds up to Mother Nature or how it is to use. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. 
This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. A clash has occurred on 6 meters in Australia with the popular FTA digital mode introduced in June 2017, nominating 50.313 megahertz as a worldwide operating frequency already occupied by a propagation beacon. The Barossa Valley Beacon, VK5RBV, has been switched off to avoid interfering with stations running FT8. Mind you, VK5RBV has been operating for many years on 50.315 MHz, but the developers of FT8 have nominated 50.313 MHz as its operating frequency. The WIA Technical Advisory Committee is carefully looking at the matter and welcomes input as it looks for a new beacon frequency. The obvious choice would appear to be the band segment beginning at 50.400 MHz. This segment has already been adopted by IARU Region 1 as its new exclusive beacon segment, and it is logical for us to follow the same path. This may be a forerunner of similar clashes as more new digital modes come into use in the same part of the band. FT8 is also becoming popular on 2 meters and may be ideally suited on a group of spot frequencies recommended for modes of different bandwidths. The narrowband channel on 144.320 MHz is the logical one for FT8 in the WIA band plan, but it's noted that 144.313 MHz has also been used for FT8. The new digital mode of HF at weak signal levels, lower power levels, and almost any antenna is enabling a lot of contacts, but the trend on 6 meters seems to be using on high power levels. FT8 in its description has been designated for sporadic e-propagation where signals may be weak and fading. Openings may be in short duration, enabling fast completion of reliable QSOs. Participants in CQ Magazine's Worked All Zones Award program will soon be able to use the Logbook of the World system of the AWRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, to apply for the Worked All Zones Award and its endorsements. Both AWRL and CQ announced on December 14th. Amateur radio operators will be able to use Logbook of the World Logs to generate lists of confirmed contacts to be submitted for WAZ credit. Standard LOTW credit fees and separate CQ award fees will apply. Implementation, documentation, and internal testing of the link between Logbook of the World and WAZ is complete. AWRL and CQ are now assembling a team of external beta testers to assure that the link is ready for widespread use. A separate announcement will be made when LOTW support for CQWAZ is available to everyone. Logbook of the World is AWRL's electronic confirmation system for amateur radio contacts. It provides a confirmation when both stations in a contact submit their logs to the system and a match between the logs is confirmed. LOTW has supported the CQWPX award program since 2012. I am very pleased that the participants in the CQ Worked All Zones award program will finally be able to use Logbook of the World confirmations in their applications for WAZ awards and endorsements, said CQ Magazine editor Rich Mosens, W2VU, adding that WPX program participants have made excellent use of this service for the past five years, and we look forward to providing it to WAZ program participants as well. We are excited about the prospect of supporting CQ Magazine's WAZ program through Logbook of the World, as it is something that many ham radio operators have been asking for, said Greg Widden, K0GW, AWRL's first vice president and chair of the Logbook Study Committee. We believe this partnership will enhance the amateur radio experience for many practitioners. CQ Communications Incorporated is the publisher of CQ Amateur Radio Magazine and is the world's largest independent publisher of amateur radio magazines, books, and videos. Worked All Zones is the second oldest active amateur radio award program behind the International Amateur Radio Union's Worked All Continents Award. And now, with his segment on working amateur radio satellites, here is AMSAT North America's own Bruce Page, KK5DO. Satellite operators are continuing to push AO91's footprint to the limit. Joel EB1AO and Mike W8LID completed a 5,955 kilometer QSO via the satellite this past week. 
The maximum elevation of the pass was just 0.9 degrees for Mike, and Nakusa was made at 0.5 degrees on his end. Who will be the first to complete a 6,000 kilometer Cuso? The theoretical maximum range is 6,072 kilometers. Visit AMSAT.org for the distance record page and complete list of all satellite records. Thanks to Paul N8HM for this story. Pedro, CU2ZG, says he will be active on satellites from Grid Square Hotel Mike 58 on Christmas. Expected operating days are December 23rd and 24th, plus December 25th during the afternoon and evening hours. Pedro says this will be a family holiday and schedule will be accepted depending on his availability. Watch his Twitter account. P-D-S-O-U-S-A for updates. Thanks, Pedro, for the heads up. This is our last report for 2017. All of us at AMSAT wish you and yours the very best for the holiday season. We will be back with more satellite updates in January. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. This week we bring you a most unique approach to what would normally be an audio-video presentation. It has been said that a picture tells a thousand words. In this case, however, you'll have to use your imagination to picture a truly amazing antenna farm. It belongs to world-class contester Tim Duffy, K3LR. While you can't visualize what Tim's phenomenal multi-multi contest station looks like, put your mind's eye to work and absorb what Tim's description is of his 10-acre Midwestern ham station. Here's Tim Duffy, K3LR, as excerpted from his 2017 Dayton Hamvention Forum Talk. I'm going to tell you a little story today about my radio life of K3LR, which is about 45 years long, and it started in my bedroom. A year after I got my novice license, I was a general class license. Once I discovered contesting at a field day, I was hooked, like many of you. That was my first introduction. K3LR is about as far west in Zone 5 as you can get. It is right up against the Ohio-Pennsylvania border, equidistant between Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Akron, and Erie, Pennsylvania. It's exactly one mile away from the border. And the northern part of the property happens to front on Interstate 80. Back in 1991, I got a knock at the door, and it was... RA3AUU. This was just when uh, the Russians started to travel over here for Dayton, and I was stunned to see a Russian at my door, and I couldn't tell my neighbors at that point. Actually, UA3AB was with him too. It was a good time, but over the years, many people have stopped to say hello on their travels on Interstate 80. One of the things that makes this QTH work is how the drop-off occurs. And I did not know this when I bought the property. I bought the property back in 1987. Things like HFTA were, were not around. But there was a famous DXer that lived in the Pittsburgh area. Some of you may remember W3CRA. W3CRA used to have an outstanding signal into Southeast Asia and other DX locations when others could not be heard. He had a tremendous drop off in that direction. So. Going to Europe, the QTH drops off about 300 feet to a riverbed, and likewise to Japan. It's pretty flat going to the other directions. It's not particularly high, but it is that 300-foot drop-off that is the real secret to the fact that we do well to Europe and Japan. There are 13 towers. Eight of the towers comprise the 80-meter vertical array. This station was built over that period of time from 1987 through today and multi-multi since 1992. Tom talked about receiving arrays being very important. They're vital to the health of a multi-multi that wants to have two radios on a band. We have two full-size four squares that you would use to transmit on. One is for 10 and one is for 20 meters. They look weird because they're very small in their footprints but they are very effective for the second station to hear while the CQing station 
is on the air. There's a 160 meter five element array. That's a three element vertical Yagi that has been featured in the ON4UN book, the last three editions. It has five dB of gain off the front of it and about 30 dB of front to back. There are a pair of 80 meter four squares. These are full size elements, broadside on Europe, and it's just like stacking Yaggies. You get three dB more gain. And then the, the tall tower is the 40 meter tower. The top antenna is at 275 feet. In the middle of the property is the 15 meter run stack. That's a, a stack of four seven element Yaggies. And then the 10 meter four high stack is on its own tower, 32 elements. And then the second tallest tower is the 20 meter tower, which has its top antenna at 245 feet. So let's take a look at some of the hardware. This is the 40 meter tower. It has three full size, four element OWA Yaggies, the WA3FET designed. And it has four 10 meter antennas on it. It has two 20 meter antennas on it. It has a 160 meter horizontal wall or flag on it. 138 square feet of wind load on one tower. And it's all engineered that way. It's a pie rod tower. It's a 24 inch face. I live very close to the neighbors and I get along very well with the neighbors. That's a critical element in the success of this multi-multi. Here's another photo of the bottom part of that tall tower. There's a six element 20 meter beam there at 150 feet and right above it it looks like a 15 meter beam. That is the pair of Waller flags that are horizontal. This is the N4IS top beam antenna at 165 feet and sometimes that is the best receiving antenna for 160 meters. It's not always. We have a lot of different antennas for 160 to receive on, but this has been a, an effective antenna at times. I'm a big fan of ring rotors. I have a lot of TIC ring rotors as well as some K0XG ring rotors, but all but one Yagi is mounted on a ring rotor on the side of the tower. The top antennas are rotated with K7NV prop pitches. This is the 20 meter tower. The 40 meter tower and the 20 meter tower both have FAA lighting and painting because they exceed the 200 foot limit. At 245 feet is a 80 meter dipole. It's got shortened coils in it. So it's about 106 feet long and there are steps that go up the mast so I can climb that three inch mast to get to it. There's a tornado coil in the middle of that dipole that allows us to tune anywhere between 3.5 and 3.9 megahertz. And then that's one of the six element 20 meter beams. There are four six element 20 meter beams on this tower. And this is the top one at 230 feet. This is looking down the tower. There are a pair of moxins for 40 meters on here. One at 185 feet and one at 120 feet. And this is what the second station on 40 meters uses for transmitting antennas. There are two 15 meter beams for the second station on here as well. You can see the two 20 meter beams designed by WA3FET at 170 feet over 110 feet. That's the middle two Yaggies. A lot of antennas on one tower, very carefully engineered so they don't interact with each other. This is a shot of the 10 meter array. It starts at 135 feet and it's got four eight element Yaggies on it. You'll notice there are no insulators on these guy wires. These are all fiberglass guy wires used to uh, hold these things up and so you don't have to worry about insulators. This is the 160 meter antenna. It starts with a driven element that's 120 feet tall. And then we put four parasitic elements that surround the 120 foot tower. Those parasitics are T's. They're T's made out of wire and they are dropped from the top of the driven element. And so in this case, the two yellow elements are used to point to Europe. The right hand element is grounded as a director. So all four of these are cut as directors. And then the left hand yellow element is a reflector in this case. So simply by putting a coil in series with it, it becomes a reflector. And then the two blue elements are floated. So they're invisible in this case. So you get a reflector, a driven element and a director and you get a three element vertical beam that can be switched in four different directions. And there's a lot of ground radials that go on here. This is under the driven element. This is the pie rod tower that I feed. 
with inch and five eighths on 160 meters. It is almost 1,500 feet away from the uh, shack, so we had to have some low loss cable here. Over the period of almost 30 years that this tower has been up, I have put in additional ground systems. There are now 300 radials underneath the driven element. The parasitic wires also require full radial systems as they operate as verticals. Here's the ground systems that are for the 80 meter verticals. These are converted high towers. So it's basically take a high tower, strip all of the stubs off of it, and increase the length of the high tower. Each one of these high towers is now resonant by themselves at 3.51 megahertz, not up at 3.8, uh, because they have to be longer to be used in a four square array. But I take ground systems very seriously. When I was in high school and starting out in college, I was a broadcast engineer and fortunately got to learn a lot about creating ground systems and that's what I used to build these. Here are the four verticals in the center of the array. My good friend uh, Greg Ordy, W8WWV, has spent many weekends helping me tweak and tune these arrays. This is the 20 meter four square that we use exclusively on the second station on 20 meters. It too has full complements of radials but you can see the elements are much shorter, but it is a full size 20 meter four square. This is the 15 meter four square used by the second station on 15, and you can see just how close the neighbors are at K3LR. This is a, about as good a shot as I can get of the eight circle array. This is a high C eight circle that is used on 160 and on 80 meters. This is the inside of the eight circle control box. There are actually two sides to this control box, 160 meters and 80 meters, so that the array can be pointed in any direction by either operator without the other operator knowing about it. There's also a full complement of chokes to make sure that all the feed lines going to all the elements are choked cold. There is a modification to the high Z preamps that I made that we do not deliver DC power through the same cable that we receive the signal on. So there are also a full complement of chokes for the DC power as well. Basically this array goes dead cold once you get above four megahertz so that it can survive in a multi-multi transmitter environment. This high Z eight circle array has replaced all the beverages at K3LR and it has worked out very well for us. This is the front of the K3LR house. This house was built in 1865. It was not the house that impressed me when I bought this place, it was the land. My very good friend and multi-multi mentor, Frank Donovan had 10 acres and this was 10 acres and I said, I'll take it. But through the years we've modified the house, I did not know when I bought the house that it did not have heat upstairs and certainly things like electric and water and gas have all been added since the house was built. We have our own 50 kW transformer from the Pennsylvania Power Company. When I originally started operating multi-multi, I was sharing a transformer with my neighbor. It was 15 kW. And once Sunday came around, you could see that the line voltage was starting to sag. So the power company was very nice and put in our own 50 kW. In case that goes away, we have our own Chevy V8 Kohler 50 kW natural gas generator. These radio contests are serious things. And if we lose power, it doesn't mean that W3LPL and WE3C go off the air. So we have to make sure that we can be back up and this brings us back online in 10 seconds. This is a shot of the radio room. When I built this radio room, I thought it might be single op and maybe some multi singles. And my very good friend, Scotty N3RA said, why don't we try multi multi? And so in a 30 foot by 30 foot room, we have 11 operators, 11 operating positions, two for each band, 80 through 10, and one on 160. Although this summer that will change and we'll get a second position on 160 meters. And that concludes our experiment of bringing a sound description of the world-class contest station, voiced by and belonging to Tim Duffy, K3LR. We excerpted his 2017 Dayton Hamvention presentation. Now that you've heard about Tim's station, go see what you can see on YouTube. And it's really spectacular. 
We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. Each year, the residents of McMurdo Station, Antarctica, celebrate Christmas by singing and sharing Christmas carols via HF using a non amateur radio frequency just above 40 meters for those at the remote Antarctic field camps. They'll be doing it again in 2017 on Saturday, December 23rd at 2300 UTC. Multiple stations are involved, each with different equipment, explained Nathaniel Frizzell, W2NAF, an assistant research professor at New Jersey's Institute of Technology, who has been part of the chorus in the past. McMurdo Station and South Pole Station probably have the most powerful equipment. Field camps and remote stations could be calling in with systems that put out as little as 20 watts. Frizzell said McMurdo Station would serve as net control of sorts to coordinate the various broadcasts, which will include a small choir and vibraphonist John Piper at McMurdo. Other camps and South Pole Stations each will have a chance to chime in. This year, we'll be asking ham radio operators around the world to listen and email shortwave listening reports to tell us how far away the carols are heard, Frizzell said. The last time I did this, almost all the positive QSL reports were from South Pole Station. The broadcast will take place December 23rd at 7995 kilohertz USB at 2300 UTC, which will be Christmas Eve in some parts of the world. Frizzell requests reports via email. For a Christmas in Antarctica SWL QSL card, send an SASE to his home address. A YouTube recording offers a sample of last year's transmissions. A graduate of Virginia Tech, Frizzell started the HAM SCL, HAM Radio Science Investigation, sponsored the Solar Eclipse QSO party this past year at NJIT. He works in the Center for Solar Terrestrial Research. The 2015 recipient of the prestigious William R. Goldfarb Memorial Scholarship, Jacob Nunez Kearney, KF7DSY of Mesa, Arizona, will interrupt his matriculation at Purdue University to accept an internship this spring at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. This is an amazing opportunity that has been many years in the making that I have decided to accept, Nunez Kearney told ARRL. He will return to Purdue the following fall, and because he already had college credits when he started his freshman year, he should still be able to graduate in four years in 2019. He remains a full-time student during his internship. A graduate of Desert Ridge High School in Mesa, Nunez Kearney is pursuing a career in aerospace engineering. The ARRL Foundation administers the Goldfarb Scholarship which is the result of a generous endowment from William Goldfarb and to ITP Silent Key. Before his death in 1997, Goldfarb set up a scholarship endowment of close to $1 million in memory of his parents, Albert and Dorothy Goldfarb. It is awarded to one high school senior each year. The South African Radio League will host the 2018 Youngsters on the Air Summer Camp although in this case it will become the Yoda Winter Camp as it's being held in the Southern Hemisphere. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Executive Committee and its Youth Working Group Chair Lisa Leenders, PA2LS, have accepted and approved SARL's proposal. The annual event brings together young people from Region 1 and elsewhere for a week, creating an opportunity to learn all about different nationalities and cultures, foster international friendships and goodwill, and learn new amateur radio skills. The SARL and the South African Yoda Working Group are delighted with the response, and we are looking forward to hosting a successful Yoda 2018 event as an unforgettable African experience that will be remembered for many years to come, SARL said in announcing the 2018 Yoda Camp. Dr. Gary Immelman, ZS6YI, will serve as patron of the event. SARL President Nico Van Rensburg, ZS6QL, conveyed his appreciation to the Yoda Working Group in South Africa for its successful proposal. He said hosting the 2018 Yoda Winter Camp would be a golden opportunity for SARL and for amateur radio in South Africa to make their mark in promoting amateur radio amongst younger generations. This past August, 80 young people attended Yoda Summer Camp in England, sponsored by the Radio Society of Great Britain. Two young amateurs from the U.S. attended the 2016 Yoda Summer Camp in Austria. Every day is a good day to send CW, but January 1st is reserved for Straight Key Night, sponsored by the ARRL. 
Enjoy CW as it has been sent and enjoyed since the earliest days of amateur radio. The 24-hour event begins at 0000 UTC on January 1st, New Year's Eve in the U.S. time zones. It is not a contest, but a day dedicated to celebrating amateur radio's Morse heritage. Participants are encouraged to get on the air and enjoy conversational CW contacts, preferably while using a straight key or a semi-automatic key. No points, everyone's a winner. Submit your votes for Best Fist and Most Interesting QSO. The First Class CW Operators Club sponsors a concurrent event, FOC Bug Day. FOC asks participants to send a description of the bug or bugs used, a list of stations worked, and a vote for the best bug fist heard to FOC Bug Day Manager, Benny Owens, K5KV. AMSAT will sponsor its second annual Satellite CW Activity Day on January 1st. This year's event is dedicated to the memory of Pat Gowen, G3IOR. No rules, just have fun. Operate CW through any ham radio satellite. The use of straight keys and bugs is encouraged, but not required. And finally this week, December is the month in which three notable events in radio history occurred. The first radio transmission heard across the Atlantic Ocean in 1901, the first broadcast of the human voice and music in 1906, and the first successful transatlantic amateur radio HF transmission in 1921. Here to tell us more about these historic events is Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. On December 12, 1901, Italian wireless pioneer Guglielmo Marconi succeeded in receiving the first transatlantic radio signal transmitted from Poldu in Cornwall, England, to St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada. On Christmas Eve 1906, experimenter Reginald Fessenden made what may have been the first radio broadcast to include speech and music. As he's done in years past, Brian Justin, WA1ZMS of Forest, Virginia, will commemorate that first audio broadcast by operating WI2XLQ on 486 kilohertz this month, marking the 111th anniversary of Fessenden's accomplishment. Historic accounts say Fessenden played the violin, or a recording of violin music, and read a brief Bible verse, astounding radio experimenters and shipboard operators who heard the broadcast. Justin will begin his transmission on December 24th at 1700 UTC, and continue until December 26th at 1659 UTC. For his transmitter in 1906, Fessenden used an AC alternator modulated by placing carbon microphones in series with the antenna feed line. Justin's home-built station is slightly more modern, based on a 1921 vacuum tube master oscillator power amplifier design. The transmitter employs Heising AM modulation, developed by Raymond Heising during World War I. In 1921, ARRL sponsored two series of transatlantic tests to see if signals from previously qualified amateur radio stations could be heard at a receiving station in Ardrisson, Scotland. The second series succeeded, with several ham stations heard on the receiving end using equipment far superior to what had been available to Marconi just 20 years earlier. Connecticut radio amateur and radio history buff Clark Burgard, N1BCG, will be among those celebrating the 96th anniversary of the first transatlantic shortwave transmission in Greenwich, Connecticut. Several other stations will take part by establishing contacts between the U.S. and Europe, including GM7VSB and Audris in Scotland. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1HSX. Marconi's team in Cornwall transmitted the letter S in Morse code, and this was heard by Marconi and his assistant, George Kemp, at a facility set up in Cabot Tower on Signal Hill in St. John's. On the Cornwall side, Marconi had erected a powerful spark gap transmitter, feeding a massive antenna. The receiving team used a kite antenna. The experiment proved that radio signals could be transmitted beyond the line of sight, opening the door to global wireless communication. An article in the December 2007 issue of QST suggested that absorption may have been less in 1901 than in the 21st century, perhaps contributing to the success of the feat, which occurred during daylight on the Canadian end. 
This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like the Benton County Radio Operators Club repeater system on 145.290 MHz and 443.025 MHz in Northwest Arkansas following the Thursday evening BCRO repeater system 7 p.m. net. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, amateur radio newsletters from around the world, sources on the Internet, and the packet bulletin board systems of the United States and Canada. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.